Hello everyone! I want to welcome you on behalf of Blossom Trip team on today's Josip Broz Tito virtual tour. Today we are going to talk about Tito and Yugoslavia. If you have any questions, feel free to write them in the comment section below. We will answer them after the tour. This is a free tour, but tips are appreciated. You will have all the information after the tour if you would like to contribute. Now we can slowly start with our tour. Did you hear about Yugoslavia? If you are the older generation, you surely did. You can't mention Yugoslavia without mentioning Tito, General Tito. Throughout the history, the Balkans has had a very interesting political picture. It was ruled by various rulers, making the local population mostly unhappy. One of the most beloved characters of our parents and people who lived in the period of Yugoslavia is Tito, even today. So we use this opportunity to tell you little more about him and Yugoslavia. Democratic Federal Yugoslavia was proclaimed in 1943 by partisan resistance led by General Tito. Later, the country will be renamed as the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Six constituent republics that made up the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia were the Socialist Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Socialist Republic of Croatia, Socialist Republic of Macedonia, Socialist Republic of Montenegro, Socialist Republic of Serbia, and Socialist Republic of Slovenia. He was known as General Tito, but his full name was Josip Broz, born in Kumrovets, today's Croatia. He was seventh of eight children in the family. His father was a Croat, while his mother was a Slovene. Tito identified himself as a Croat, like his father. His impressive life will leave you wowed, and you will see how a small town boy became one of the most important persons in 20th century. On this tour, we will talk about his life, his work, his lifestyle, his presidency, and his legacy. He was working different jobs and changed them a lot, traveling from one to another city and from one country to another. He left his hometown Kumrovets at the age of 15 and worked in a restaurant. Later, he got a three-year apprenticeship as a locksmith. During his apprenticeship, he was encouraged to mark International Workers' Day also known as Labor Day. And during that time, he also was selling newspapers. After his apprenticeship, he went to Zagreb to search for employment. When he was 18, he joined Metal Workers Union and participated in his first labor protest. After that, he was repairing bicycles and joined his first strike action on Labor Day 
in 1911. After a brief period of working in Ljubljana, later in Savinia Alps, he was offered a job in Bohemia, today's Czech Republic. When he arrived at his new job, he discovered that the employer was trying to bring in cheaper labor to replace the local Czech workers. After he found about that, he joined a successful strike against the employer. In the next couple of years, he moved to few cities going from Czech Republic to Germany and Austria. During his time in Vienna, he spent his time fencing and dancing. During this time, he learned German and Czech. He was drafted into military service in 1913. He distinguished himself becoming the youngest sergeant mayor in the Austro-Hungarian army. He served for two years in Austro-Hungarian army. When he requested to serve for Croatian home guard called Domobran in Zagreb, he learned skiing during the winter in 1913 and 1914 and was sent to a school for non commissioned officers in Budapest. After that, he was promoted to sergeant mayor. At that time, he was only 22 years old. He took his fencing really seriously and in 1914 won in fencing competition on the championship in Budapest. With the outbreak of World War I, he marched with the Croatian Home Guard toward the Serbian border, where he was arrested. After his acquittal and release, his regiment served briefly on the Serbian front before being deployed to the Eastern Front in Galicia in early 1915 to fight against Russia. There, he was wounded in the back and captured. As a prisoner, he was transported to a hospital near Kazan, today's Russia. He was in the hospital for 13 months. There he learned Russian while reading the Russian classics, such as Tolstoy, and became acquainted with Bolshevik propaganda. After that, he was sent to work in a camp in Ural Mountains. Throughout the years, Yugoslav revolutionary spirit is building up in him. In 1917, he participated in demonstrations in St. Petersburg. And after the October Revolution, he joined the Red Guard unit in Siberia. Following a white counter-offensive, he went to today's Kyrgyzstan and afterward returned to Siberia. There, he married a Russian woman and joined the South Slav section of the Bolshevik party. In 1920, he returned to his native Croatia, which was kingdom of the Serbs, Croats and Slovenes at that time, and he joined the Communist Party of Yugoslavia. The Communist Party of Yugoslavia's influence on the political life of Yugoslavia was growing rapidly. On the elections in the 1920, they won 59 seats and became the third strongest party. 
after the arrest of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia's leadership, they contacted Tito, who agreed to work illegally for the party, distributing leaflets and agitating among factory workers. In 1924, Tito was elected to the Communist Party of Yugoslavia District Committee, but after he gave a speech at a comrade's Catholic funeral in which he stated, We swear, comrade, until the end of our lives, we will fight for the idea that you were so divided to. He was arrested when the priest complained for spreading communist propaganda. In the mid-1925, Tito's employer died and the new mill owner gave him an ultimatum, gave up his communist activities or lose his job. So, at the age of 33, Tito became a professional revolutionary. He served as a local and regional party functionary and trade union organizer in Croatia and Serbia until 1927 when he joined the Communist Party of Yugoslavia's committee for Zagreb and quickly becoming its organizational secretary. His success at reviving the Communist Party of Yugoslavia's vitality was cut short by the arrest in August 1928. The police discovered the bombs in Tito's apartment during his trial, which ended with sentencing to a five-year term, Tito defended himself with exceptional courage and gained further credit with the party authorities. After two and a half years at Lepoglava prison, Tito was accused of attempting to escape and he was transferred to Maribor prison, where he was held in solitary confinement for several months. After completing the full term of his sentence, he was released, only to be arrested outside the prison gates and taken to Ogulin to serve the four-month sentence that he had avoided in 1927. He was finally released from prison on March 16, 1934. During his imprisonment, the political situation in Europe had changed significantly. After his return to his hometown, he didn't stay for long because he received a word from the Communist Party of Yugoslavia to return to his revolutionary activities. For the next six months, Tito traveled several times between Zagreb, Ljubljana and Vienna. He was using false passports. Tito adapted various pseudonyms, including Rudy and Tito. He used the latter as a pen name when he wrote articles for party journals in 1934, and it stuck. He gave no reason for choosing the name Tito, except it was a common nickname for men from the district where he grew up. By 1937, Tito was increasingly involved in the Communist Party of Yugoslavia's underground work in Yugoslavia, where he established ties with the new generation of militants. 
in 1937-38, Joseph Stalin's purges devastated the Communist Party of Yugoslavia leadership. Tito profited from the repression, gaining the Comintern's mandate to replenish the Communist Party of Yugoslavia's leadership councils. In 1939, he was elected for Communist Party of Yugoslavia's new Secretary General. So, how Tito became partisan leader? An opportunity for armed insurgency presented itself after the Axis powers, led by Germany and Italy, occupied and partitioned Yugoslavia in April 1941. Tito responded by forming a military committee within the Central Committee of the Yugoslav Communist Party. Attacked from all sides, the armed forces of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia quickly crumbled. The Communist Party of Yugoslavia remained the only organized political group ready and capable of contending with the occupiers and their collaborators throughout the territory of the defunct Yugoslav state. After the partisans managed to endure and avoid these intense Axis attacks between January and June 1943, and the extent of Chetnik collaboration became evident, Allied leaders switched their support from Draža Mihailović to Tito. King Peter II American President Franklin Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill joined Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin in officially recognizing Tito and the partisans at the Tehran Conference. In liberated territories, the partisans organized people's committees to act as a civilian government. The Anti-Fascist Council of National Liberation of Yugoslavia was convened in Bihać, Bosnia and Herzegovina on 26 and 27th of November 1942 and in Yaitse, also Bosnia and Herzegovina on 29th of November 1943. As a result, Tito's partisans became a threat not only to the occupiers and collaborators, but also to the royal government in exile and its domestic exponents, the Serbian Chetniks. The Soviet army, aided by Tito's partisans, liberated Serbia in October 1944, thereby sealing the fate of the Yugoslav dynasty, which had the strongest following in the largest of the Yugoslav lands. Tito consolidated his power in the summer and fall of 1945, by purging his government of non-communist and holding fraudulent elections that legitimated the jetsoning of the monarchy. The Federal People's Republic of Yugoslavia was proclaimed under a new constitution in November 1945. 
1953, Tito was elected as a Yugoslav president and was repeatedly re-elected until 1963, when his term was made unlimited. Although he used his secret police to purge political opponents, the average Yugoslavians enjoyed more freedoms than the inhabitants of any other communist country in Eastern Europe. During the period, Tito evidently enjoyed massive popular support due to being generally viewed by the populace as the liberator of Yugoslavia. The Yugoslav administration in the immediate post-war period managed to unite a country that had been severely affected by ultranationalist upheavals and war devastation while successfully suppressing the nationalist sentiments of the various nations in favor of tolerance and the common Yugoslav goal. Negotiation with Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt and Juwahala Nehru of India in June 1956 led to closer cooperation among states that were non-engaged in the East-West confrontation. From non-engagement evolved the concept of active non-alignment that is the promotion of alternatives to block politics as opposite to mere neutrality. Under Tito's leadership, Yugoslavia became a founding member of, of non-allied movement. In 1961, Tito co-founded the movement with Egypt's Gamal Abdel Nasser, India's Nehru, Indonesia's Sukarno, and Ghana's Nekrumah in an action called the Initiative of Five, thus establishing strong ties with the Third World countries. Tito's foreign policy led to relationship with a variety of governments, such as exchanging visits in 1954 and 1956 with Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia. Tito was notable for pursuing a foreign policy of neutrality during the Cold War and for establishing close ties with developing countries. Due to his good relationship with other governments, Today, in his honor, many streets and squares carry his name. Twelve in Slovenia, twenty-nine in Croatia, twenty-three in Bosnia and Herzegovina, eighty-six in Serbia, five in Montenegro, twenty-four in northern Macedonia, also in Algeria, Angola, Brazil, Cambodia, Cyprus, Egypt, Ethiopia, France, Ghana, India, Italy, Kazakhstan, Morocco, Nigeria, Russia, Tunisia, and Zambia. The break with the Soviet Union also inspired a search for a new model of socialism in Yugoslavia. In this area, Tito never was a theoretician who depended on the ideological formulations of his lieutenants. 
but he supported the notion of workers' management of production, which is embodied in the formation of the first workers' council in 1950. After the constitutional changes of 1974, Tito began reducing his role in the day-to-day -day running of the state. Tito became increasingly ill over the course of 1979. In January 1980, he was admitted in a hospital in Ljubljana due to circulation problems in his legs. Tito's own stubbornness and refusal to allow doctors to follow through the, with the necessary amputation of his left leg played a part in his eventual death of a gangrene-induced infection. His adjutant later testified that Tito threatened to commit a suicide if his leg was ever to be amputated and that he had to actually hide Tito's pistol in fear that he would follow through on his threats. After a private conversation with his two sons, Jarko and Misha Bros, he finally agreed and his left leg was amputated due to the arterial blockages. The amputation proved to be too late and Tito died at the medical center of Ljubljana on 4th of May 1980, just three days before his 88th birthday. Tito was interred in a mausoleum in Belgrade, which forms part of a memorial complex on the grounds of the Museum of Yugoslav History, formerly called Museum 25th of May and Museum of the Revolution. The actual mausoleum is called House of Flowers, Kucha Cvecha. And numerous people visit the place as a shrine to better times. The museum keeps the gifts Tito received during his presidency. The collection includes original uh, prints of Los Caprichos by Francisco Goya and many more. Here are some interesting facts about Tito and Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia had a liberal travel policy permitting foreigners to freely travel through the country and its citizens to travel worldwide, where it was limited by most communist countries. Tito met many world leaders during his rule, including British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, Indira Gandhi, Margaret Thatcher, John F. Kennedy, Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, Yasser Arafat, Queen Elizabeth II, Gaddafi, and many, many more. Because of its neutrality, Yugoslavia would often be rare among communist countries to have diplomatic relations with right-wing anti-communist governments. For example, Yugoslavia was the only communist country 
allowed to have an embassy in Alfredo Stroessner's Paraguay. Tito's funeral attracted government leaders from 129 states. At that time, it was the largest state funeral in history. This concentration of dignitaries would be unmatched until the funeral of Pope John Paul II in 2005 and the memorial service of Nelson Mandela in 2013. It included four kings, 31 presidents, six princes, 22 prime ministers, and 47 ministers of foreign affairs. Tito carried uh, on numerous affairs and he was married several times. He had four wives. His best known wife was Jovan Cabros and she was also his last wife. Tito was 60 and she was only 27 at the time when they married. Certain unofficial reports suggested that Tito and Jovanka even formally divorced in the late 1970s, shortly before his death. However, during Tito's funeral, she was officially presented as his wife and later claimed rights for inheritance. The couple did not have any children. Tito was also a huge hedonist. He did not hide that he liked to eat, drink, dance, and play the piano. They say that he liked to eat Zagorje Strukli the most. He smoked Cuban Tampas, and his favorite drinks were Chivas whiskey and Slovenian wine Cvicek. Tito hang out with many celebrities, including Hollywood stars, who came to Yugoslavia in the 70s for roles in some of the most famous partisan films. Richard Barton played Tito in the Sutjeska movie. He and his wife, Elizabeth Taylor, came to Pula in 1971, where they met Tito and his wife Jovan Cabros. Kirk Douglas was in Belgrade in 1964, and during lunch at the American Embassy, he stated that he would like to meet the president of Yugoslavia. The next morning, Tito sent a private plane to transport Douglas and his wife to Ljubljana, where they talked and walked for three hours while drinking wine. John Lennon and Yoko Ono sent him a letter for peace in the world and the astronauts from the Apollo 11 crew, Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins and Edwin Buzz Aldrin brought him pebbles from the moon. Stalin gave him a golden saber. King Muhammad Zahir of Afghanistan brought him the head of a Buddha from the 4th century AD. And Prince Charles brought him a model of a Dubrovnik sailing ship. Tito spoke Serbo-Croatian, German, Russian and some English. He understood and read French and Italian. 
and also spoke Kazakh. Josip Broz Tito received a total of 119 awards and decorative emblems from 60 countries around the world. Also, one interesting fact is that villas which Tito accumulated were of a huge variety, from castles to hunting lodges to seaside manors to luxury palaces and well beyond. In Belgrade, he resident in the official residence, Bailey Dvor, and maintained a separate private home. In Briuni Islands, Croatia, was his summer state residence. He also had a residence on Lake Bled, Slovenia, and many more. We can't forget to mention Vila Stojčevac near Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina. House was in style of a modern rustic lodge, but it wasn't just a house, it was a west network of tunnels that were built under and around the compound. Meant to serve as a protection, as well as clandestine transportation for Tito between sensitive sites. Today, the villa sites are in ruins, unfortunately, completely destroyed and devastated. Also, another place is Tito's Bunker. It is a Cold War era nuclear bunker and military command center located near the town of Konitz, also Bosnia and Herzegovina. Built to protect President Josip Broz Tito and up to 350 members of his inner circle. In the event of an atomic conflict, the structure is made up of residential areas, conference rooms, offices, strategic planning rooms and other areas. The bunker was built from 1953 till 1979. It was built into the mountain, impressive construction that is until today preserved intact. The bunker remained a state secret until after the breakup of Yugoslavia in the 90s. Today, it serves as a meeting point for artists from across the region, Europe and the world. Also, it is a museum that tourists can visit. Yugoslavia after Tito He kept the lid of the mutual hostilities of the various Yugoslav nationalities People felt safe. Unfortunately, after his death, everything slowly collapsed. Country strong as Yugoslavia was left without its leadership and at the mercy of others. At his death, the state treasury was empty and political opportunities unchecked. After a period of the political and economic crisis in the 80s, constituent republics of Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia split apart. But the unresolved issues caused the bitter inner ethnic Yugoslav wars. During the summer of 1991, both Croatia and Slovenia declared their independency 
Macedonia followed, and a few months later, finally, Bosnia did the same. This put an end to Yugoslavia and marked the beginning of the worst bloodshed in post-World War II Europe. With this, we finish today's tour. I want to thank you once again for being here with me on today's Josip Broz Tito virtual tour. Still, if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the comment section below. And here you have all the information that you need if you would like to contribute. I hope you had a good time on this tour and I hope to see you on the next one.